Yeah. Quarantine at home, like I said, it's not so bad when you're newlywed. No, it's it's <laughs> it's really not, and especially me as a gamer. I mean, I, I do some work yeah. here, and then I just turn around and I play my Xbox or whatever. I'm, all I'm right, good. all right. I'm good. You know, this is this is it, man. I love so, it. I love it. Well, listen, um, it, it's it's been a minute since we we caught up. Um, you know, my my I guess my first question is what you've been doing um as far as projects and stuff i mean you know how you've been uh what's the uh what what is is there anything out there that you can that you can share with us as far as you know a little oh sure like there? i said uh like i said um you know we're working on the family show yeah um, oh yeah tell me about that tell me how what's that all, what that's all about uh well you know my daughter is monique slaughter and she's she's our oldest daughter she's been on she's been a reality star for quite some time mm -hmm. uh and you know some things that you know we weren't so comfortable with but had to give her you know her respect because she's a grown person first of all but also right. she was taking care of her family financially uh so we were able to uh she was able to get out of her contract so that she was able to do something different so okay. we're trying to also put something together to help her uh, and, and help the entire family and, and everybody do their thing and showcase the talent that the family has. That's the first thing. Right. Um, uh, but the other thing I've been working on, I just, uh, I finished scoring my first movie. Yay, Dave. What? Uh, uh, maybe I finished the score probably a few months ago. Uh -huh. uh, but then now the all the editing has been done. So we're doing some touch-ups on that. So I, every now and then, you know, maybe at least two, three times a week. I'm spending, you know, six hours, seven hours uh, going over the score, making fine edit points and just making some changes and make sure everything's right. Dude. Yeah, thank you. Thank Come on you. Now. Yeah, That's unbelievable. I'm, I'm, really, I'm really hyped about that. And, you know, you, it's just like uh, when I first started producing um, uh, and, and arranging the temptation is to kind of overdo it yeah uh but um what i've learned is that it's better to have more and then take some stuff out and as you really try to uh, sense the emotional impact of it whether you're working on with music or whether you're working uh with film um just make sure that the emotional impact is what it is that you want so right and then you're removing everything that um and this is a tip that i got from said that's superfluous to that emotional um, uh, uh, state that you're trying to create. And so you don't have anything extra, you just have the actual uh, uh, tone that's tr that you're trying to set. So that's a good thing. Wow. So um, and any chance that you could tell us the name of this movie yet? Or is it too early? Uh, I can't tell you the name, but I can tell you the genre. It's a horror movie, so, and ironically, um, huh. I was glad that I was able to start on something like that um, because then you're able to delve more into textures and, and sound creation um, mm -hmm. as versus, you know, trying to make uh, 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 symphonic scoring, so to speak. Right, right. Okay, so that means that you have to get with sound designers and all that and just kind oh, of... Yeah. Yeah, find, find yeah. that that build those libraries mood. absolutely. Right, right. Well, let me ask you this then. Um, uh, I, I guess this question is kind of twofold. Is um, now that you're that you're doing this, that you're into uh, film score, um, how much of an influence, if at all, or, or any kind of tips did you get from Mervin? Because as you know, he's he does a lot of that. Yeah. Um, and uh, let's start with that. You know, did, did Mervin kind of step in and, and give you some tips and pointers on? Uh, no, not really. Because the first thing I really wanted to do was, since this was my first one, really find my own voice, so to speak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I really spent a lot of time before I really started delving into syncing with picture and, and making sure my ideas worked with the, with the picture, just kind of feeling what my what my voice was, so to speak, cinematically. Right. And in so doing, I really just spent a lot of time exploring different types of scores. So, okay. of course, I checked out some of the stuff that Merv did. I uh -huh. checked out uh, uh, John Williams scores. I checked out just the different genres of scoring to kind of see what was speaking to me. Uh -huh. And then I kind of studied those that did a little bit more and sort of just started finding my own voice that way. 
Got it. Got it. Um, so does that mean that uh, on the arranging side, uh, would you say that you found your own your own style there or did you take some cues from from Mark? Oh, well, you know, I always say there's nothing new under the sun. And especially when you're when I'm arranging for take six, I always think about not just Mark. Of course, I think about what Mark does, but what Merv has done, what Cedric has done, mm -hmm. and, and little pieces of what Gene Perling has done since I was introduced to them uh, by uh, Mark and Merv, yeah. introduced to Gene Perling by Mark and Merv, uh, and said as well. And really just um, take cues from them, but at the same time, like like we were talking about before, They'll find not, your own voice. not lose my own voice. So what, yeah. you, what you really find out it's just about everybody who is a creator is an amalgamation of everything that they've consumed, uh, all the create creativity that, they, that they've consumed and listened to. Mm -hmm. And then as that filters through who they are, that becomes your voice. That makes right. Sense. Got it. Um, I, I wanted to ask you uh, something. Um, I don't know if you saw um, a couple years ago, I did when I was out in LA, I did this thing um on the on take six universe which was the it was like the the battle of the of the albums yeah know? i think and, i remember uh, those threads going back and forth yeah and um you know i i've always said i mean i don't get me wrong i love the first album okay yeah that's that's my jam okay but when you guys came out with feels good yeah. to me that is the greatest album that you guys have recorded so my question is um I was talking to Mark the other day and he said that, you know, feels good, you know, holds a special place in, in his heart and that you and him really work closely together to, 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 you know, make that album what it was. I was hoping that you could talk about that and, and, you know, how that, how that whole process was and how you felt during that time of creating, in my mind, in my opinion, a masterpiece. Um, well, let me just start off by saying, um, when you try to get any one of the guys in Take Six to really talk about our albums mm -hmm. and, and to really compare one with the other, it's like saying, you know, I like my son a little bit more than my daughter, but... <laughs> no, I, I don't want you to do that. Let's, I'm and just no, focusing and on no, I'm just saying, you know? I'm just saying that's, <laughs> that's the funny thing about it for us. Yeah, you know, yeah. Because we, we, we've created them all. Sure. And depending on where we were, uh, uh, philosophically at the time, where we were even getting along with each other, you know, the albums are what they are. Yeah. Um, so each one of those is like a, a, a moment in time, uh, both emotionally, spiritually, philosophically for where, where we are as a group. Right. Um, but that being said, Mark and I and the whole, the whole group really, we did put pretty much if there was ever a project that we can say we really put 150% into it, maybe yeah. even 200, it really was that one. And the reason why is because that was the first time that we really got up the nerve to say we're going to do this on our own record label. Yeah. And because of that, you know, we were just like I said, when I first did the movie scoring, you know, you kind of overdo it, but we were like, we were intent on making sure that there wasn't a weak link on the project. Yeah, yeah. No, dude, man, that that album for me um, is is unbelievable. I mean, I was so, we were all, you know, everybody on the message, we were so excited for that album to come out. And me to the point where I even got the the Japanese version of that album three months before it hit the States. <laughs> Because because <laughs> who was it that sent it Love to me? Uh, I think it was I think it was Mika that Michiko. sent it. To me. Well, it was Michiko, yeah. Michiko, yeah. Yeah, she sent it to me, and it has you know it has the extra track in it and all that stuff, and it's still one of my prized possessions because you know nobody else had that, you know. Yeah. Uh, so we, I was super excited, man, and that that album is to for me like the best it really is i mean we were paying attention to we've always as take six paid attention to detail yeah um and we have really merv uh that was really his thing he was a stickler for detail mm -hmm. uh, and he set that tone in the group mark was already there of course cedric was already there as well but we would rehearse at nauseam till everything we did was literally in sync yeah. um 
as far as from a production standpoint with feels good one of the things that we were really experimenting with is the sounds and the ambience and the background and the breathing uh, mm -hmm. uh, in between notes so to speak yeah so that just made this whole super organic uh feeling that was just amazing so you know it's and and, and we're pleased when you guys actually appreciate what it is that we do Oh man, I mean, <laughs> I, I I hope that you go on at least the the Texas Universe and see the kind of conversations that go on there when they start you know analyzing albums and stuff like that. I mean, and even back then, and, and with the message board that used to be on your website, uh, yeah. the conversations that go on it's, it's it's crazy. I mean, even some of these questions, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at some of them. Uh, they, they, they I haven't so... had a chance to look at, at the questions for me. Yeah. Oh no, the, I haven't seen them. Oh yeah, no, there's there's stuff in here. I'll start trying with the easy one, okay? Um, <laughs> they get hard, huh? Okay. <laughs> Bobby wants to know. Um, he says the guitar is a very intimate instrument. Uh, does it inspire your creativity or just help you relax and reflect? Uh, both. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you know, just listening to guitar. Uh, I remember. Um, when I was in middle school, I think, um, did something just happen? Did the view just changed? Uh, nope. I, I, I was in middle school, and my sister got um, an Earl Clue project. I mean, mm -hmm. we were just listening to that over and over and over. Um, and even though the stuff that he was doing uh, just acoustically him solo guitar mm -hmm. um i think the song was called waiting for kathy or something still one of my favorite songs uh -huh. um on on the heartstring album i listened to that so much and i was like man i really need to learn how to play the guitar i was already a prince fan and so um i liked the guitar because it was one of those instruments that can express itself almost like a singer mm -hmm. if you really could play mm -hmm. so that kind of inspired me to just went out I would go to the music store, uh, hang out, play guitars in the music store. And finally, my mom saw that I was so interested in the guitar and, and she knew I was a Prince fan, which ironically she didn't approve of. And yet she still bought me my first electric guitar. So nice. She, she hooked it up. <laughs> and, and, um, and so, um, but yes, yeah, to say, to say it, I do. So for instance, if I'm creating from a guitar, uh, mm -hmm. it just, just gives me a different texture and a different feeling so suddenly my mind can go in different directions if i'm on a keyboard mm -hmm. the same thing depending on the sound that i hear it kind of inspires me in one way or the other so when you arrange do you primarily do it on a keyboard or on a guitar primarily on the keyboard yeah okay yeah okay um, because when i'm playing uh, i'm not really playing it in the way that take six would sing it when i'm mm -hmm. first approaching an arrangement I'm usually on the keyboard, just kind of get getting a feeling. Mm -hmm. If the feeling that I'm tr going for, I don't really feel like I'm getting it on the keyboard, I might pick up the guitar just to get a different rhythmic approach, see how right. I would do it there. Then I come back to the keyboard if I'm starting to lay it out for take six. Okay. Um, do you have a favorite arrangement that you've done uh, aside from you know the, this movie project that you're doing? Um, you know, be be it for take six or for someone else. You know, do you have one of those that you're like, this uh, is the one? Wow. Um, well, jumping back to another question before, I remember when I first did the arrangement for White Christmas, mm -hmm. I really was thinking, what would Mark do with the baritone here? Literally, that's that's pretty much the entire that. Uh, 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 combined with the rhythmic approach that I knew I wanted to do mm -hmm. of, of a Latin feel uh, and then just making sure because that kind of moving baritone is really something that is uh, almost inherent in Latin music um, I just was telling myself what would Mark do right here and it just turned out pretty good as far as I'm concerned yeah yeah <laughs> right on I dig it no no this is this is great man I listen I um by the way if you're just tuning in, uh, we're talking to one of the legends of Take Six, Mr. David Thomas. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, we're just here uh, chatting away, just uh, you know, talking about life and all that good stuff and music. So thank you to everyone who's tuning in. Um, let's see here, I got another one for you here. I, I, I would add though, that, yeah. um, 
last project, Sailing, was our first uh, radio number one. So that was very impressive uh, of an achievement. Right. And, and I was able to do that arrangement just sitting on the beach in Hawaii, listening to Sailing over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And finally, just looking out at the water, trying to uh, uh, think of how I could incorporate sort of the waves and that undulating water feeling into the yeah. song and there you go what would you um you know talking about you know that as a as a huge achievement uh would you consider that your most proudest moment in your tick six career or did you have another another point in your career when you were like this is the pinnacle um, well, I did feel like we were really peaking right around feels good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm glad that you brought that up, excuse me, um, because, uh, we, and we put so much heart and soul for about a couple of years after that, you know, I almost felt depleted. It was mm -hmm. almost like we had birthed something really um that just took everything out of us to do. And mm -hmm. then when our distributor went bankrupt, it kind of really just sapped it out of us. And I almost didn't think that, <laughs> I was questioning whether or not we'd be able to go on, to be honest with you. Oh, um, after feels good? After feels good, yeah. Because so much heart and soul went into that to be crushed by, and things were taking off. Mm -hmm. uh, right when the distributor, uh, uh, the parent company, which was Tower Records for our distributor, mm -hmm. went bankrupt. So then all the money that they owed us, we became a creditor to the court history. Wow. So that was, that, that was painful. But, yeah. you know, after that, you know, struggle produces uh, good things sometimes. And so after sure. that, that's when we did the uh, uh, white, uh, white Christmas. Uh, most, most wonderful time. And we're right. quite close on that project. Mm -hmm. um, so let me ask you this. Is it easier now? Uh, because now that we have all these streaming services and everything, um, this is kind of something that I, I asked uh, Mark as well. Um, is it, isn't it easier now to put out music if you wanted to? Like you could say, okay, you know, you guys have, uh, you know, your, your studio at, um, at Joey's house. You can go there and record the whole thing and then have somebody mix it and master it for you if, if you know, well, Mark is probably going to mix it. But, you know, you have somebody master it and then you put it out as a digital download on all platforms for $9.99. People will buy it. You know, now you don't have that middleman anymore. Is it easier now or, or am I uh, off base? Um, yes and no. And I'll mm -hmm. explain that. Um, I want to recap the last question, though. Uh, yes, uh, having radio success is something that, you know, we don't view that as our crowning achievement. Right. Um, but we do appreciate it. So, sure. yeah. Um, but I just wanted to actually say that. But when it comes to whether or not it's easier or more difficult um, with all the streaming services, the, the problem with the streaming services, as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. is that they cut a deal um, with the record industry the recording industry um that basically has them operating as startup companies even today so at the beginning when they were trying to compete with radio and more uh classical distribution uh methods uh they really couldn't financially compete so mm -hmm. they got um uh certain loopholes that they were able to get around and certain things that were put in place from years of experience to protect the artist, uh, they were able to get around. So mm -hmm. now really what end, ends up happening is that artists don't make as much money from streaming sure. as they used to do from more classical distribution methods. Right. Uh, so for instance, there was a time when uh, Pharrell, uh, Happy was, was one of his big hits. Mm -hmm. And I think he had, I forgot how many hundreds of millions of streams and he said that he was making 3,500 bucks <laughs> from his streaming income. Yeah. So um, it's easier to get music out to your fans. Mm -hmm. It becomes a more, you have to kind of relearn how to monetize that in a way um, and take advantage of that monetarily. Right. So it's really not that things have changed that much. 
other than technology always moves things forward sure. and it all moves the cheese. So you kind of have to kind of move along with it to keep your cheese on flow. Right, right, <laughs> right. Okay, yeah, I, I was just wondering about that, you know, because, um, yeah, you know, we all, we, we as supporters and fans, you know, we want you guys to put out as much music as you can and we'll, we'll pay for it. You know, I, I don't subscribe to, I mean, I, yeah, I have a, you know, iTunes and whatever, but trust me, if you, if you guys put it where it's like, no, you, you can't stream it. You got to pay for it. You know, 999, I'm hitting yeah, so by. If, we if we were solo artists, that, that would be a, you know, things suddenly had would have gotten so much easier. But for us, we still have to usually our records feel better when we get, at least the upper vocals at, can all come together and record together so we can get a similar in the room feeling. Right. So to speak. Um, then we add Vin the solos and other stuff later. But, um, and for us to do that still requires money. Does that make sense? Yeah, because yeah, of course. We're all live in the same places. Uh, mm -hmm. For instance, it feels good. I literally went and to Mark's house for almost a little over a month, mm -hmm. just working every day in the studio, he and I. Right, right. Um, um, so to do that, you know, it it, it takes it, it take it's a big effort. You know what I mean? Of course, so yeah. It takes a lot to move a six member group as as a soul as a one artist type entity. So. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Right. I, yeah, no, I I totally understand that. I mean, um, e even just you know scheduling these uh, the, these live events with you guys, you know, it's like. Uh, put everybody on a chat. Let's all talk about it. Let's see what we can do. And, you know, I, I get it. Yeah, I, so, I mean, you know, my friends have my phone number. So <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I always say so if you're if you're if you're waiting on me to find you on a uh, 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 messenger, and, mm -hmm. you know, some of those things that just turn off my notifications. Yeah, I will not be able to put my phone down. Yeah, yeah. No, I that's why I called you, man. I was, Yo, man. It, yes, I said, hey. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's some I know there's some people out there all jealous like how oh, you yeah, have these people's phone numbers out there we go way back we go way back go way back listen uh, how's uh how's Marla doing man because uh, I just you know just thinking about that whole way, way back you know you guys were on my podcast episode 25 yep. and it was both yep. of you guys and, and she was great you know how's she doing she's doing great yeah uh, right now she's up at uh, Moniz's house with uh, Cameron, our grandson, and mm -hmm. they're cooking and doing some stuff, and I'll see her this evening. Awesome. <laughs> but was, we're, we're doing great, man. She's really focused on um, on uh, our uh, nonprofit, uh, Love and Beyond Reason, mm -hmm. uh, which is our uh, nonprofit for people who care for adults with um, mental disabilities, mental mm -hmm. health disabilities. So. Uh, we, since we know how difficult that was for us, we wanted to re put something back into the community and kind of help out. Okay. All right. I love it. Um, here, let me, uh, let's go back to something here. Let's see. Uh, here's one from, uh, Jason. Um, this question is, it says, I saw a pic of you, uh, in your place of recording. Uh, do you use acoustic treatment? or fix your vocal recordings with EQ to get a clear and crisp sound? Uh, I assume that he's talking about, do I EQ my, how I EQ my vocals when it comes to recording vocals. Uh, I guess yeah. we're gonna do mm -hmm. specifically for take six. Yeah. Um, when I record, you know, I kind of need to hear things as flat as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, keep things just kind of the way that they are. So yeah. that I can monitor and make sure that I get, uh, we we used to say, get to tape uh, the best possible recording I could get according with levels and everything as well. Right. Uh, but of course, we don't use tape anymore. But uh, I start to reinforce it after if I'm trying to present it for someone else. I make sure mm -hmm. that I EQ the vocals after after the fact. Right, right. Um, what would you say, uh, you know, because you guys obviously, um, you know, Mark does a lot of arranging for you guys and... Um, I, I did actually get to hear um, one of his um, multi-track samples that he sends out to you guys so that you guys can learn your parts and all that, which is brilliant, by the way. And um, so I guess the next question is, you know, uh, what would you consider to be the hardest uh, arrangement, you know, or song that, you got, that you've had to learn? 
What do you think? Wow. Um, and that's coming from uh, everyone's favorite, Sandra. Sandra Hawkins. <laughs> Sandra. Well, you know what, Sandra? I'm still kind of mad at you. I'm, I'm only your second favorite. Oh, she did say that. She did say Mark, that. Mark, Mark is her absolute favorite, and, and rightly so. I'm not, <laughs> if I have to come second behind somebody, I will bow to Mark. Uh, but anyway, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Um, uh, so the question, well, repeat the question one more time, please. Yeah, yeah. It says... Oh, uh, the hardest arrangement that I've had to learn. See, for yeah. me... Um, or actually, just a, yeah, just a, uh, it, she says, what's they're the hardest not, take six they're songs? Not really hard, they're not really hard to learn anymore. I think the one that took the most time is either between Sundays on the Way or Jordan. Okay. And that was kind of old school, everybody sitting down in the same room, learning your parts. And that, um, um, and going through those earlier years, the process that we learned by rote, really allowed us to kind of fine tune our ears, especially those of us that were in the meat locker. Yeah. Uh, as we dubbed it back then. Yeah. Uh, because one of the things that we would really try to do as you're hearing um, whoever was giving out the parts, whether it would be Mark, whether it be Merv, whether it be, uh, as, you, as you hear them teaching someone else, but as they're, <clears throat> excuse me, playing the arrangement, mm -hmm. your ear starts to chew in on what your part would be. And so the game used to be, before uh, whoever was giving up the arrangement got to you, if you already knew your parts. So we were already trying to pick out our parts even before we learned them. I see. Through that whole process over time, you just kind of hear where you are in the chord and you kind of know kind of where you fit in. Mm -hmm. So you just really only need little fine tuning hints on certain voicings where you could go one way or the other. Yeah. That I, makes I, sense. So by yeah. doing so many years i can't even say it's difficult anymore yeah I, I you know no go ahead i'm saying to be honest i can't say that it's difficult anymore mm -hmm. okay i i you know um we've been talking a lot of you know with the other members and you know talking about the you know how yeah. those rehearsals used to go back in those days and how legendary they were how long they were and all that give me your perspective on on rehearsals and just learning stuff and 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 even the the early the very early performances and the, any kind of challenges that you guys had back in those days versus now um you know things did change uh maybe the change might be subtle to some mm -hmm. but for us it's a big kind of a shift of perspective and that was in the early days we focused so much on the rehearsal process and on perfection from a part performance uh aspect mm -hmm. uh, and, which included your breathing your phrasing yeah uh, making sure that everyone was listening to the guy next to you and everybody all together making sure that you sound like one organism mm -hmm. uh, to over time and that was like i said that was really uh, one of the things that Merv really brought to the group. Mm -hmm. um, Sid also kept that going. Um, uh, but at the same time, after Merv left, we started sliding more into the focus. That was almost taken for granted that we can actually sing as one. Yeah, uh, We put in so many years working together. The focus then started shifting into making sure that we emphasize the feeling. Uh, mm -hmm. the arrangement, uh, whoever, whatever the, whoever the arranger was trying to actually present and making sure we really capture that feeling. And in order to do so, sometimes we ended up keeping things that years earlier we would not have kept because it wasn't quite as perfect. But when it feels just right, um, our definition of perfection started to shift a little bit, if that makes any sense over time. Right, right. We shifted more into what it felt like, culminating really with pretty much the feels good. Um, so coming back to that, you brought that up earlier, mm -hmm. uh, where it was a combination of what you guys were and what we were used to uh, from a take six perspective, from an implied perfection, but also just enough imperfection that feeling wasn't lost, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I, I went to a, a couple of, um, uh, you know, a couple of concerts during that time. 
Um, one for me, most famously, was the one uh, where Christian, you know, Christian wasn't full time in the group just yet. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I had an extra ticket, and he actually, I, I gave it to him, and he was sitting up with me in the front row. Remember that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. I remember that. Yeah. And, um, and, and it was just, and so what I was going to say about that whole situation was, is that you guys obviously were doing, that was the feels good, you know, tour and all that. And the, the sound and the tightness that was coming out of it, you know, out of that concert, um, you, you could tell that, that, that just that genuine feeling that man, you know, this is, this is, you know, the, the peak of what Take Six is all about. You know, and that's why yeah. a lot of times, you know, when, uh, when I, the only thing that I can say that would kind of add context to your observation is by then we had also matured mm -hmm. as peers. You know, you can hear the sound and our voices change from a more youthful sound to a more mature sound. Yeah, singers yeah. as soloists, um, we were just really comfortable in our own skin. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it was it, it was really great. I, it was just one of those things where I, I just looked at it and I was like, you know, and, and when if anyone asks me, hey, what, you know, what one or two songs would you say, you know, identifies the Take Six sound? I always come back to uh, This Is Another Day, your version of This Is Another Day. And also um, even way back uh, to I Got Life. Like those two songs for me, Anybody ask me, I'm like, you listen to these two right here, and you know what it's all about, you know? Yeah, yeah no, I, you know, man, <laughs> uh, both of those arrangements are uh, Mark Kibble, uh, ingenious arrangements. Yeah. Um, so I can only say, and I say this with all seriousness, that I just happen to be lucky enough, blessed enough, to be born at a time when I can actually be in a group with, in my opinion, the greatest acapella arranger that has ever lived. <clears throat> so, you know, that's just high praise for Mark, but he definitely deserves it. Yeah, no, and there's uh, about, there's about 4,000 people on uh, Take Six Universe that agree with you. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so. Indeed, man. And, and, I, and I love, I love, uh, Merv's arrangements. I love Sid's arrangements. I love mm -hmm. AD's arrangements. You know, I love to arrange myself, but um, Mark has a, a rare gift. Yeah. And it's also, when I used to talk to him about it, it was like, you know, when he feels an arrangement, he can't really explain it, but he just has the whole thing. It's just like mm -hmm. it's downloaded into him. So, yeah. <laughs> That was also the fun of it for me, sitting next to him and arranging and working on producing the Feels Good project as well. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it shows. It really does. Um, let's see. Here's a, here's a funny one. Um, you ever considered uh, making any solo recordings? I, I have done solo recordings. Um, and there was a time when I first moved out to L.A. that things had gotten kind of rocky um uh, relationally in the group that i thought that i might have to go solo yeah uh, and i almost did it but it was one of those things where it didn't feel like the reason was right if that makes any sense sure yeah it felt like i was mad at the guy so i was going to do a solo project and that's just not a good reason yeah uh, um, because, like I said, um, that was the beginning of me kind of coming into my own and kind of maturing, not only as a singer, as a musician, but also as a man. Mm -hmm. uh, people fail to realize that we were young boys. <laughs> we oh, yeah. Politics. We got in the group. And so sort of this whole slide into professional musician was a thing where you know, some of us had planned this life and a lot of us had not planned this life. So we were kind of learning as we go. Mm -hmm. So when I first moved out to LA, I just felt uh, creatively stifled. And so uh, lucky enough for me that it didn't actually break the group apart. Mm -hmm. uh, but there, it, it, it was pretty close there for a minute. Yeah. Tell me, um, I, I always, uh, 
you know, I, I like to ask all you guys uh, about that first Grammy win uh, way back when. Um, I remember seeing it live on TV. Um, I was blown away by that first album, you know, um, especially when you guys, you know, put out that, you know, if we ever, because mm -hmm. as everybody knows, uh, the Breath of Life Quartet is is like my favorite. And that's how, you know, that's where that's I heard it. People the... know that hidden gem there, Julio. <laughs> everybody knows. <laughs> that's the hidden gem, baby. I'm telling you, but some of these kids, they don't know about that. They I don't know. I'm trying to they educate. <laughs> And so um, I, I just wanted to get your perspective on on that, uh, you know, on being there, on performing, and having Stevie Wonder, you know, jump up out of his seat because that performance was so amazing. I mean, tell me about that night. Man, that night was really a blur. Um, yeah. Most people don't know that the Grammys, for those of us that attend, especially for those of us who are into jazz and lesser popular genres of music, um, uh, it Doesn't starts for us. It starts for us early in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So we start uh, getting ready first thing in the morning. The limos and cars are there to pick you up. Sometimes as early as one, you know, noon, one thirty. Right. You get down there. You got a red carpet. If you're performing, you got to get backstage. Mm -hmm. It's just a madhouse. Um, at the same time, you're excited if you're lucky enough to be nominated. Uh, if you're lucky enough to win, there's stuff that you got to focus on your performance, your performance, or anything else like that. But you're also so excited because you see people that you grew up idolizing. Your own musical heroes are there, so it's just a. I'm trying to kind of convey the busyness of the day. Sure, so that of course. I, I can then explain to you that by the time we won that first Grammy, we all ran up there and we were just beaming. Yeah, uh, like a deer in the headlights, man. And it, right. almost, it took me about two months to kind of decompress and kind of say, wow, and wow. just feel the moment. And that was that was only uh, just the tip of the iceberg because we were touring so much back then that it was just boom, 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 one thing after another. So. Yeah. Things were moving so fast for us back then that it, it almost took us a couple of times going to the Grammys to really start to appreciate and feel what the moment really was. Right, right. The moment was way bigger than our than my capacity to feel. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because you were all in your early 20s at that point. Yeah. And, and just being... My wife was pregnant with my son. Yeah. <laughs> it was just out of control, man. <laughs> I can't even imagine, dude. I, I you know. And, and I can't I, even really remember. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wish, I honestly do wish that you guys would have come along at the time of, of social media um, because the, the, the reaction would... Now, actually, that's a good question. You guys came in at a time where, you know, where, you know, you guys literally set the world on fire with your style, okay? And how you guys, you know, presented that first album and the second album, you know? Um, do you think that if you guys would have come out now with those first two albums and how social media is and how the state of the record industry is, uh, just musically, not necessarily, you know, streaming services and all that, how do you think that Take Six would be received nowadays if what you guys did back then, you did it now? Well, I'll answer that. You know, those are always tough questions um, because if we came out now, we would have had the benefit of the shift in technology. We would have the benefit in the shift of even sound creation, right. uh, the benefit of recording techniques, the benefit mm -hmm. of everything that came before us, just like we did when we when we came out in uh, 88. Right. So... I can't say that what we would have created if we came out now would actually sound like it did back then. In oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, imagine at the time when our imaginations were able to go wild, um, if we had the technology, the ability with technology to kind of fix notes and, and to keep certain performances that didn't need, that you would have let go, you know, 30 years earlier mm -hmm. and, and redid it so that because you're 
focus at the time was on perfection. Imagine if you can make it perfect and keep some of the emotional content at the same time, you know, and it, it, I just can't, I can't call it, man. I put it to you that way. Yeah. It's almost impossible for the way my mind works to say what something would have sounded like 30 years later um, because of all of the sort of the, the timing is part of it. That's what I'm really trying to say. Yeah. yeah. The, the sound that we had was based on it being the 80s. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. Well, well, well my question wasn't really combined with, the, combined with the historical perspective. Yeah. So the, now that the sound has changed, you know, we would have, we would have had a, like a head start, so to speak. I would say. Yeah. Well, I mean, my question wasn't really um, uh, geared toward uh, w whether or not your sound would be different. It was more about whether or not you think that Take Six would have had the same success coming out now as it did back then, now that there's more social media and whatever. How do you think that Take Six would have been received? Like, Here's what I say. Guys are, you know. I say part of the reason that's, that people are successful in the entertainment industry is they have that thing. Yeah. And, they call it the it factor, whatever you want to call it, you know. Um, but Take Six has that thing. And that thing is not necessarily that I, Dave Thomas, has the thing. Or Mark has, well, Mark has a thing. Yeah, yeah, um, Mark has a thing. Yeah. Or, 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 or any of the individual guys <laughs> have things. When we get together, the thing that Take Six has is greater than the sum of the six parts, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. well, it's almost like, you know, a, a, a super ranger, a power ranger. Mm -hmm. like, together mm -hmm. that makes something much bigger than than the sum of themselves. So Sure. Okay. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. Um, here's one from Blake. He wants to know, um, I'm wondering, uh, do you and Claude switch parts when singing Getaway Jordan like he did with Mervyn. Yeah. OK, yeah, moving on. Do. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do. Uh, and mainly because, you know, a lot of people think that singing the melody or singing the top part, which is a lot of times the melody, mm -hmm. um, it's easy to do. But, you know, none of us really have that range in real life. That's just something that we're able to do. Mm -hmm. And Claude singing up there and to make it sound good, hitting the note is one thing, but to make the note sound good, you know, uh, takes some effort. So to keep him from being worn out when we sing it live, mm -hmm. that was how we started. And it really just became, uh, I choose not to sing that high. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so if it's a high note, why, why work? Let's let somebody else do it. Right. So, hey. Um, answer this question for me. Um, I've always wondered, um, there are certain, there are certain songs that you guys uh, don't sing live, or um, it takes a little bit for you guys to get to where you are going to sing that song live. And, and some of the things that I've heard you guys say is, well, we haven't learned that song yet, right? Mm -hmm. um, in order to sing it live. So I was wondering if you can elaborate on that. What does that mean? Because in my limited brain i'm thinking okay if you guys learned your parts and you know to sing it on the record then what's the difference in singing it live so i was hoping you could explain that to me um uh, well since we learn by rote a lot of times when we're recording something new uh for the studio mm -hmm. we haven't sat down in a room and learned the arrangement back in the right. day we learned the arrangement before we did anything else Sure. Um, whether we performed it or whether we were recording it, we learned the arrangement first. Mm -hmm. uh, after a while, and that's kind of what Jim Ed told us when we first got signed. He said that first project, you've had your whole life to, to perfect. Okay. From this point on, you have months to perfect something new. Okay. And so because of that, the demand on your time combined with uh, having to tour, a lot of times we perform things in the studio that again, we haven't taken the time to learn. And right. learn just to know that I'm familiar with the notes is one thing. To be able to perform that in an entertaining way on stage is another whole complete thing. Okay. So um, usually, um, you know, our first initial performance of something is nerves are there a little bit and mm -hmm. things get better over time. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, used by the time we feel more comfortable when we step on stage to know that we have not just the notes, but the entertainment factor under our belts as well, how to perform the song. That so say we don't know an arrangement, we're familiar with the arrangement. We just don't actually know the arrangement enough that we feel comfortable singing it on stage. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So did, so um, I, I guess that goes into this other question I have, um, because I was talking to Mark about uh, live music and releasing live music and all that. And he says that he, he he's a he's a perfectionist when it comes to to live music and, and how it's released because it's forever and all that. You, you pretty much share the, the same sentiment on that. Yeah, you know, um, and with anything that I've done, I can look back and feel like, man, I, I hear things in the arrangements that feel like I could have done better, mm-hmm. to be honest. Um, and so because of that, um, that goes back into sort of the balance between sort of do you make it perfect uh, or do you sacrifice some of the feeling? I'm, I'm never one to feel comfortable sacrificing the feeling. Um, for the perfection, mm-hmm. uh, I always lean on lean that way. Um, but yeah, no, it takes a lot of time. And so, when I mean, you asked the question before about technology, does it make it easier for us or harder? Mm-hmm. Uh, now that everybody can record on their own at home in their own studios, mm-hmm. we don't really have a lot of times the same feeling. Now we are familiar with each other because we've been singing each other for decades. Right. Sing- other for decades but sometimes on something new you might approach this differently if you heard what somebody else was doing in the studio with you right right Um, I'm wondering, um, uh, will hell freeze over before all of you do one song that includes Merv and said, how long until I got to wait to have just one song in the studio with all of you? I don't know, man. I would love it. Uh, it you, you got my vote already. Yeah. <laughs> but I will tell you this, it's hard enough getting the six of us to agree on anything. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> to add two more guys is, is going to be a long shot. But we're working on something now that we think that's going to be pretty special. Um, I, I know that Claude is, uh, is doing some stuff. And um, I think he's going to – he's actually – I talked to him today. And um, after uh, uh, Tony does his thing on for Friday – yeah um we're gonna look and see uh which date uh fits best and we'll get claude on here and he's gonna talk about a lot of cool stuff but um anything that you can divulge uh on any any take six projects coming up anything that uh, we, we should be looking out for uh, one of the things that we're really starting to work on is creating in uh sort of non-conventional ways and in the other endeavors so um maybe starting a commercial house Mm-hmm. both from a, a sound perspective as well as a video perspective. Um, uh, working on probably just not so project focused as brand focusing, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Be the best way to say it. How, uh, how alive is Take Six Records and the Take Six entity and all of that stuff? You know, how's... Um... Because I, you know, I, I don't know, I don't understand uh, all of it, so I'm not sure if I'm trying to understand the question: how live? Well, how live? What is that? Well, mean? well, do, okay. Does Take Six Records, that entity, does that still exist? Technically, you know, that's just a, a, a label. Mm-hmm. And that is a sort of, sort of just like an imprint. Uh, so we still own the imprint and the label. Mm-hmm. Uh, have a home for it from a distribution perspective right now, yeah. and I'm sure that we have the motivation uh, to drive that right now.